everyone, and welcome to Mintcast, an interview series featuring dissenting voices the establishment would rather silence. I'm your host, Manar Mohawish Adli. To help us continue these interview series, you can become a member on our Patreon page, which we'll link in the video below. Um, in 1987, police in Tallahassee, Florida, were called in by locals to investigate a very strange incident. Two extremely well-dressed men were observed at a play park with six flea-ridden, neglected, and hungry children. When it transpired that they were part of a shadowy DC-based cult called The Finders, the news went viral, becoming a national scandal. And while the police dropped all charges, facts connecting the group to the CIA and rumors suggesting an agency cover-up of a wider human trafficking ring ensured that the story continued to rumble on. Now, one person who has been following this case very closely, including the recent release of FBI documents, is Elizabeth Voss. Elizabeth is an investigative journalist and Mint Press News contributor. Today, we will discuss her trilogy of articles about the finders, which you can find exclusively on mintpressnews.com. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Could you first just explain to us who the finders are? The finders are and were a group that initially began as kind of a hippie commune, and that's especially under, under the official narrative. They coalesced around a leader, uh, Marion Petty, uh, and as we'll talk about later, he and his wife uh, and his son all had uh, links to intelligence and to the military. But the group was absolutely under his control. He was a very strong, um, charismatic leader, according to both uh, former members and according to law enforcement who studied the group. They had a number of properties in Virginia and in D.C., but they operated nationally and internationally. Uh, they presented themselves again as basically hippies and spiritualists and that kind of thing, but they uh, shifted in the 80s towards uh, technology and futurism. They were very advanced in their computer technologies, and they came um, into the view of law enforcement by about 1986. They did not, there was not an active official um, investigation, at least as far as the Washington Metro Police Department was concerned, um, until December 1986, when uh, a, a tip from an informant stated that they had, they were aware of the finders basically being interested in ritually abusing children and, and some really salacious allegations there. Uh, the MPD declined to officially investigate, but in the in documents later released, we see that they were at least under the detective Jim, uh, investigation of Detective Jim Bradley. He was looking into them. Uh, so this incident in Tallahassee that you mentioned uh, really sparked a nationwide, um, you know, furor around these allegations of ritualistic abuse, abuse of children, and that and that all of those types of allegations. But when the investigation spread from Tallahassee to DC, the narrative quickly changes and the DC police essentially say that there's nothing to see here, no criminal activity on the part of the finders and the um, you know, abuse of children did not take place, et cetera. So that was you know, basically the end of the official narrative in 87. Uh, and again, the, the members of the finders were mostly um, business related. They were very uh, technologically adept they would work various odd jobs, sometimes for government. I believe one of them, I think Michael Houlihan worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in, in a, low, a low position at one point. But they would move to various places, some on the West Coast, some on the East Coast and all over and work in uh, various jobs in order to make money. And a lot of that appears to have been, um, you know, under the, the purview of the what was discovered to be uh, labeled operations in documents found by uh, Customs Special Agent Ramon Martinez, and we can get into that a little bit more later. But uh, as to what they were really doing, um, in addition to those jobs that we know about, um, I think that's that's something we can get into. Okay, well, I, I would like to know, you know, this, this happened um, in the middle of the so-called satanic panic of the 1980s and 1990s. I mean, this was a really interesting time in American history. Like, not many people know about this. I mean, is that the reason this case was given national attention, do you think? Um, or were there other factors? I would argue initially, yes. I think, I think that the mainstream press, the Washington Post, the New York Times, they were headlining stories about the finders initially um, with words like satanic cult, r satanic ritual abuse. And that really, you know, even, you know, back then that was very profitable to hype that type of panic. However, uh, I would also argue that once uh, the DC authorities got involved, that that tide shifted very quickly to diminishing what had been going on. And I think that the, the argument about whether or not 
they were um, quote unquote satanically ritually abusing is really kind of a red herring that gets us distracted from the intelligence connections of the finders. And uh, basically what that all came down to were a series of photographs showing uh, children that were in the, under the care of the finders participating in the ritual, what appeared to be ritual disembowelment of a goat, which then the finders, a couple of goats, which then the finders said was simply an anatomy lesson. And so you can debate whether what the intent of that those photographs were, but essentially that was where the story began and ended in terms of those allegations. Um, it, it is a shame that once uh, the MPD, the Met Washington DC Metro Police uh, went against that particular narrative that the entire case was dropped in terms of any press coverage in 87. We didn't see press coverage return until 1993 when a DOJ inquiry was launched into whether the CIA had interfered in that 87 investigation and whether they had covered up for actual criminal activity against uh, of the finders. Okay, well, let's talk, let's talk about the connection with the CIA and the deep state mm -hmm. and just state officials in general with this cult, the finders. Can you uh, break that down for us? Sure. Essentially, you have Marion Petty, the cult leader of the finders, who worked for the military for approximately 20 years, uh, beginning in the 1930s. And so that's when he had this um, he also had this beginning um, interaction with the early kind of hippie new age sphere, which hadn't really even begun yet into, you know, in terms of what we saw in the sixties and seventies, but he had an open house in DC while he was working for the military. He was initially in the army and he then was in the, he shifted over to the air force. So we see that uh, Marion Petty himself was a long time, uh, you know, member of the military. He was actively working in what would become the finders in terms of his involvement in the hippie sphere long before he retired. And uh, his wife is admitted to have worked for the CIA for 21 years uh, in, during the height of the Cold War. Now, FBI vault documents published in 2019 admit that. They also try to portray her as a uh, simple staff stenographer, but they also state that she was given passports to completely banned countries during the Cold War, including uh, North Korea, North Vietnam, uh, the USSR at the time, and others. Uh, in my opinion, it's interesting because, just as a slight tangent, the, it's, it's not clear to me whether uh, Isabel Petty was the only person, the only finders member given those passports. It appears to me that that's the suggestion of those documents, but that's not clear because she had died by the time that they were redacted. So her name is not redacted in them. However, some once at times when it's referred to as to who received those passports, the name is redacted. So it's not definite that she was the only one. Uh, the uh, Marion Petty's son, he admitted worked for Air America which was, as we know, a CIA front that was involved in Iran-Contra, later, later became Southern Air Transport, and which Whitney Webb has written about, uh, had links to Jeffrey Epstein. We also see that in, and so that's just a small picture of the relationship between finders, the finders, the military, and intelligence prior to the Tallahassee incident. And, you know, just at, as a cult, their history in that way. During the 87 investigation, it's alleged that the CIA shut down that investigation, that they rendered it an internal matter, that they uh, prevented uh, the Washington Metro field office of the FBI being given the correct of uh, all of the evidence that was recovered at two DC finders properties. And essentially it's alleged that the Washington Metro Police Department aided the CIA in covering that up. Uh, and the, what we see in that, in that vein is that there, the evidence from those two DC uh, locations were not recorded, they were not described, and the evidence itself disappeared very rapidly after the, the two residences had been uh, searched and the evidence collected. We still have no record of what was found. We only have the word of uh, Customs Agent uh, Special Agent Martinez, and his word is, uh, is questioned in these documents, but also corroborated. So we then have the DOJ investigation in 1993, which is supposed to be clarifying if there was a cover-up. However, the DOJ passes this investigation on to the FBI. The FBI passes the investigation on to the Washington Metro Field Office of the FBI to, to, uh, to actually conduct. There's no special task force, as it was said in the press at the time. And the Washington Metro, Metro Field Office basically just relies on the Metro Police Department. And both of those uh, agencies were actively involved in the 87 investigation and were not neutral. So when they come up with the, with the conclusion that 
there is nothing to see here. There was no CIA intervention and there was no uh, criminal activity on the part of the finders. That's a highly questionable uh, conclusion. It was not reached by an independent third party. So basically, overall, you have uh, CIA connections, intelligence and military connections from, you know, just the history of the finders through the 87 investigation. And it appears a cover up in the 93 uh, DOJ inquiry as well. That's incredible. I mean, it's just a, a typical case of, you know, we investigated ourselves and we found that we did absolutely nothing wrong, which is something that we often uh, see uh, when it comes to these kinds of cases, especially when it comes to intelligence um, and military cases um, where crimes are being committed. And these are crimes that were committed against children, against innocent children. I know this is the most difficult part to talk about, but could you tell us what was done to these children? Allegedly, uh, what Martinez says that he witnessed, first of all, in D.C., is, is separate to alleged abuse of the six children recovered in Florida. So there, there are two kind of, I guess, um, situations in which there are allegations of, the, of child abuse. And, and, we, and we know that there's more than just six children, right? I mean, we have exactly. to assume that there's a lot more. Absolutely. The evidence suggests that. And we don't we have no record. There's no way of knowing how many more children the finders were had in custody. So basically in, in Florida, the six children recovered uh, were obviously neglected, extremely hungry. I mean, a two, I believe it was a two year old child managed to eat like eight bananas eight, when they were recovered. So the, the fact that they were they were that hungry. And I mean, and again, I, I, I think it's really important to before we even get into the really, really terrible allegations of abuse, the fact that this level of neglect was clearly documented and was not followed up, these children yeah. were not removed from care. This goes a whole, you know, many, many miles beyond simply an alternative schooling system or an alternative lifestyle community. This is neglect. The children, um, other than I think all but one child was, was not verbal. Uh, they range from the age of two to six. They, uh, the one child that was verbal stated that they, uh, were, they had been forced to live outside, that they were not allowed indoors. And this is corroborated by the fact that the children clearly did not know how to use bathrooms. They were urinating and defecating on the floor. They didn't recognize uh, household, you know, normal office objects like staplers and that type of thing. They, uh, one of them didn't seem to have any concept of time. So these are children that appear to be severely neglected just to start off. Oh, wow. Wow. Tell- Yeah. Uh, Tallahassee police uh, and authorities determined that two of the children showed signs of uh, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. That finding was later uh, uh, backtracked by Florida state authorities who said that it was indeterminate and that they couldn't really tell what had happened to these kids. So uh, that allegation is debated. But as I say, the neglect is not debatable. That is absolutely clear. Yeah. So that so that's those are the allegations of abuse around the six children that were recovered. Now it's also important to to state that initially when the police recovered these children, they assumed that these men were were had no relationship to them and could have been trafficking them. They later found out that these children were the biological children of finders members. So there was no, you know, interstate trafficking without the consent of parents. However, that doesn't excuse the neglect. Of course. When we, when we shift over to the DC locations and the allegations of abuse there, what we see are, is from the report of Agent Martinez in these customs memos that were later published on the internet long before the, uh, the FBI vault documents on the finders were published in 2019. Martinez says that he witnessed uh, in one of the finder, in the finders warehouse in DC, a vast amount of clothing for uh, toddler to preschool age children but no children themselves. In the finder's residence, the houses in which they lived, there were documentation. There was documentation of the finders uh, sending out an alert the, the night of the Tallahassee incident, stay, uh, telling, the, telling each other mm-hmm. to, uh, to basically move the children. We don't know how many, again, move the children through different jurisdictions, avoid police detection, so that by the time the next day, the finder's residences were searched by authorities, there were no children pr- present. We also have records uh, witnessed by Martinez that describe kidnapping, uh, trading, purchasing children, uh, including uh, basically a document referencing the purchase of two children from Hong Kong via uh, contacts in a Chinese embassy. You have uh, records of uh, private families that have nothing to do with the finders, almost like intelligence files on them with intelligence on the family itself. They were trying to pose as babysitters. They were looking into daycare centers. It was very clear 
that they were attempting to uh, gain access to children. Now, Martinez doesn't speculate as to what the, that purpose was that they had for that, but clearly it, it, it very, very obviously is not, is, is nefarious, I would say. Um, we have corroboration of his allegation regarding access to um, un it, unrelated families by the Metro Police Department who have at least one reference to having contacted a family because their personal information had been found in the finder's documents. And they had almost used a finder's member as a babysitter uh, via recommendation at Georgetown University. So. Well, I think a lot of people are curious to know, why are you covering this now? I mean, this took place in 1987, like you said, the court hearings or the investigation took place in 1993. Um, uh, but you, you did mention that some information about the finders was also released um, in the WikiLeaks vault uh, leak of um, the vault uh, leaks. FBI uh, vault, yeah. FBI <laughs> vault leaks of 2019. Um, right. And so... I mean, why are we, why are you covering this now? And do you think that the finders or some form of this kind of cult with abuse towards children still exists today that's connected uh, to the CIA and perhaps the FBI? Sure. Great questions. I think that, uh, first of all, in, in referencing, you know, my interest in this, I think that it's important to just lay out a little bit about how these documents came to, to the public awareness. So, the uh, customs memos were partially kind of leaked to the press in, in 1993, which is what kind of forced that investigation. Then everything goes quiet. Later on, the customs memos are published to the internet in a couple of places, uh, including by former FBI, uh, Ted Gunderson. That's a, it's a pretty decent uh, copy of them that's available now. It's been available for years. Uh, I became aware of it around 2017, and I, uh, I, I mean, obviously the documents are damning and shocking, and I had never heard of them before. So when I when I stumbled onto them, I basically found the contact information of uh, Agent Martinez, uh, reached out to him, and he can, would not go on record with me at the time, but he did confirm that he authored up the documents, that they were genuine, that they weren't some sort of fake, you know, a spoof. So. At that time, because he wouldn't go on record with me, I decided not to write about it. Uh, and especially because the, those documents were all that I knew that, uh, of being available to the public. I thought this is really interesting, but I don't know, you know, there's not, not a whole lot to add to this other than the documents themselves. So uh, later in 2019, you know, a few months after Epstein's death, we have the FBI publishing these uh, vault documents to their vault. So basically what they do is they take when people FOIA, uh, do a lot of FOIAs on a particular subject, they will sometimes gather those, the results of those FOIAs and they will publish them voluntarily to, their, to the, what they refer to as their vault. And there are lots of different subjects in that vault. So they, they published an initial PDF to that vault under the name The Finders in October 2019. And, that, and that's when I thought, okay, well, this is now, I can now cover this. This is interesting. And so, but I mean, it's hundreds of pages. So then, uh, and as I was beginning to do the ground, you know, the groundwork for coverage, they, uh, they then publish a second release, which, it, which adds to it. And you don't want to publish something until you kind of have everything that you think you're going to have available to you. They then published a third set of documents later. So I wanted to give it some time to make sure that they weren't going to publish anything else uh, when that was very clear that they weren't going to. And after some interruptions, you know, life circumstances, I was finally able to sit down and really take it all into account um, this year. So, Okay. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know those FBI documents that you did cite in your investigations. Um, did they reveal anything about this kind of cult existing today? Or what do you think about that? Yeah. So basically, they don't, to my knowledge, express any sort of because basically the, the documents themselves don't go past 1993. They're basically just FOIA records of the 1993 investigation and uh, documents from the 87 investigation, as well as uh, many, many clippings of uh, news reports from the time. You can uh, look at the work of Derek Bros, who has chased down a few former Finders members. He's got a great interview with Toby Terrell on his site, The Conscious Resistance. Uh, but those people, especially Terrell, would, would argue that the Finders disbanded uh, by, in 87, that they no longer exist. There are arguments that they do exist, potentially under a different name. And if not, even if not these particular individuals, that similar, uh, similar activities would have gone on unimpeded because there was no prosecution, there was no official investigation, 
all charges were dropped and basically nothing happened. So if there was a government relationship with this group, if the government was in any way sponsoring their activities, one would uh, logically conclude that there were no serious repercussions and whatever those activities were that they continued. You can also see, uh, although you know, different in many ways. You can see that this was not an isolated scandal. There was the Franklin cover-up in Omaha, Nebraska around the same era. Later on, we have the Epstein activities that Whitney Webb has covered so well for Mint Press. And so this is not something where it is just a random anomaly or a one-off. This is something where um, you see similar scandals in different arenas socially and in different geographical locations. So even if the finders have not continued as the specific group that they, they were as they exist in 87, I would argue that similar activities uh, continue to this day. Okay. And I think that something really obscure about this is that um, was the finders expertise in the world of computing and communication. You mentioned that when uh, the police were alerted about the children in Tallahassee that they were communicating with each other. I mean, this is like 1987, right? Not today, not 2021, where we can like text each other on Signal, which, you know, I have questions about Signal, obviously. But, you know, can you tell me how exactly did they communicate with each other so effectively um, through, commu through computing? Yeah, so I am not a computer buff, but from what the way that I read the documents and the way that I understand what they were doing, they did have a really early version of kind of like an internet network where they were basically connecting very primitive computers to each other across vast distances. So they had a link up, they had a network, I believe it was a is either TR or TSR 80 computers that were very, very early. And it's a really interesting story because you have Martinez stating that there were there was an alert sent across that network the night of the Tallahassee incident, yeah. um, and then that's kind of that's basically corroborated by the fact that uh, in the Tallahassee police reports that an unredacted copy of which was given to me by Nick Bryant, which I really appreciate because without those redactions, it's much more intelligible to understand what what we're seeing, what's going on. But in those records, we see that there was a Tallahassee police, basically part time worker who was a student at the uh, at a university of florida and they stumbled onto an one of these early computers in a phone booth on the university's campus and when that computer was brought in they found that it was actually belong it clearly belonged to a finders member and that it was commu it was not uh it was communicating with each other and it was tell it was actually keeping tabs on the investigation itself in tallahassee and on the investigators so it was basically gathering intelligence on the Tallahassee police that were participating in this investigation. Um, and that relates to the fact that there were, there were at least two vans. So the initial van that was, um, that was recovered uh, with the six children and the two men seems to have been operating in tandem with another van with additional finders members. And that's probably where this computer came from. But so and we have- that, And doesn't yeah. that- you know, just reinforce the idea that this is the 1980s when the internet was developed specifically for military and intelligence. Does that not reinforce the fact that this was very much connected with um, military and intelligence like the CIA? I think that's a very fair argument. I think that it's also, it, I mean, that is only, you know, further corroborated by the fact that the CIA admitted that it was sending agents to uh, a company called Future Enterprises, which was it was using to train its own agents in these technologies. Wow. It's alleged in some customs memos that have not been made public that that was a front company for the CIA that was run by the finders. And we do have the admission, though, that at, le that at least one finders, members work one finders member worked there. So there was a link there between the finders directly and the CIA versus this, this company. Uh, we have... Uh, Sergeant John Stitcher stating that the he was told by the CIA that the finders were a front gone bad. So there are there are a lot of allegations uh, of connection there, and also Stitcher basically implies that uh, the CIA was funding the finders as well in one key document that was released by the FBI in that vault. So you know, after you described the torture of those children and just the abandonment, obviously my heart was just aching listening to that because I obviously I have two boys and. I just can't even begin to imagine those children, what they went through. Where are those children today? Do we know anything about them? 
none of them have come forward and that's another reason that, that it's it's fairly understandable that this case hasn't received a lot of coverage even in the independent media because you don't have the same level of um, you know victims coming forward and testifying as adults as you do and you do see that in the Epstein case and in another case that are similar um, it's arguable I think that one of the reasons for that is that the, these children were so much younger and that in many cases it was their family members who were part of this group they you know they were not 12 year olds being lured in, they were, their formative memories were being patterned in this group. Yeah. So um, there, there are a couple of, of children that you can, uh, you know, you can track them down. I think it's arguable that um, it's, none of them have voluntarily come forward and I wouldn't want to, you know, um, violate their privacy in any way. So I think that it's, it's understandable that they would not come forward and it's, it is completely, uh, at their discretion as to if they ever want to do that. So Yeah, well, and I just can't begin to imagine the kind of trauma because that is such a formidable age where their subconscious is being uh, formed, their personalities are being formed, everything is being formed. Their brain is just so moldable at that age. Um, so I can't just begin to imagine, you know, what they're feeling today as adults um, if they're still still around. You know, a lot of modern day conspiracies <laughs> that have erupted in the last few years about, you know, with Q, between QAnon and QAnon and like Pizzagate theories um, seem to draw similar conclusions and topics to the finders. Um, do you think that the real history of the finders has affected modern day conspiracy culture? I would say that modern day conspiracy culture uh, kind of seizes upon stories like this in a way that whether intentionally or not serves to kind of dismiss them further and make them radioactive for independent press or any press to look at. And you can really see that in the coverage of the finders by Vice, who directly tried to tie the finders to the Pizzagate and QAnon conspiracy theories. Um, it's, it's a shame because I feel that it's such a, it's such a sol potentially sensationalized and salacious type of topic to begin with that when you have these types of conspiracy theories that add even just the most ridiculous claims possible, it makes it basically, I mean, not, only, and not just for journalists, but for people who are independent minded in general, it makes it much less likely that you're going to even look at stories like this. Uh, so I think that they definitely serve to reinforce that binary of either CNN is right or CNN is completely wrong and we should all just get our information from 4chan. They're kind of like a self-reinforcing binary. And the, the independent angle, the independent um, view on these stories gets lost in that process. I think that's a real shame. Tell me more about this Vice story that you cited. Sure. And how, and how they, and how, I mean, how did they cover the finders? Because you know, Vice is like a hipster rag magazine who... And a lot of time, and here goes my rant about Vice News, <laughs> but I, a, a lot of times they receive their uh, information and their news wires straight from the Board of Broadcasting Governors, which is like, you know, state-sponsored propaganda that's paid for by uh, our taxpayer money. And so we know that Vice News very much pushes a neoliberal agenda. So how does, how did Vice News cover the finders? Yeah, so basically... Uh, you have the fi the finder story coming to the fore again in 2019 with those vault documents. That's when Vice uh, covered it because at that time, obviously, a lot of the press was talking about Jeffrey Epstein. There was a lot of, of raised awareness about stories like this, and so the fact that the the vault documents came out during that time, uh, you know, it so it really um, raised a furor amongst the independent um, independent media a little bit, like just in terms of awareness. Uh, and then, so it seems that Vice chose that time, in, uh, that publication in 2019 as a great way of dismissing any interest in the story, because obviously these vault documents are damning if you really look into them, if you actually take the time to seriously read them and understand what they're, what they're portraying, what they're saying, uh, there are serious questions raised about the role of intelligence in this, this cult. So what Vice does is it basically says that, uh, that the finder's cult was the quote ground zero for QAnon and Pizzagate conspiracy theories. It has the word conspiracy theory uh, brandished all over. And it basically just parrots the 90, 1993 DOJ inquiry um, findings at the end. It doesn't go through any of the evidence, doesn't give the narrative in a way that where you understand a lot of these questions that have never been answered. It simply says, well, the official narrative was that there was nothing to see here. 
was a really weird case, but uh, ultimately nothing to see here because the authorities told us so and leaves it at that. So basically, Vice News did what mainstream corporate media does and just takes the establishment line, uh, the state line, <clears throat> and just runs with it. They didn't even question or you know put a lens, a critical lens on that kind of coverage. That's yeah. very, very unfortunate. Well, we're so happy that you have been covering this. Um, the the Finders series uh, written by Elizabeth Voss, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, can be found on mintpressnews.com. And Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you uh, explaining this very, very sad and disturbing story. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.